at a nice plateau. Great. Um, well, welcome everybody and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Claudia Trevor Wright and I'm the Campus COVID-19 Vaccine Initiative Project Director at the American College Health Association. Today, we'll be talking about campus vaccines, the routine, COVID-19 and everything in between. Special thanks to GlaxoSmithKline for supporting today's presentation and the foundation's work on campus vaccination best practices. Because of their support, we're able to bring you this education at no cost. However, there is no uh, continuing education credits available today. This webinar will be recorded and those registered will receive a link to the recording. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from a panel of experts on the anticipated rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines on college campuses how the pandemic has affected routine vaccination and opportunities for catch up and lessons learned from past infectious disease outbreaks that are applicable to the current moment. Avalier Health recently published a report examining the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on adolescent and adult vaccine utilization in the United States. The link to the full report will be posted in the chat. This report noted that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, routine vaccination rates were stagnating worldwide. And that in the US, vaccination services for adolescents and adults substantially decreased at the beginning of the pandemic and have not rebounded since. Today's speakers will help us understand what we can do as college health professionals to remediate this deficit as we dedicate significant energy to ensuring an equitable and effective rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines on our campuses. It's worth noting that our goal is to ensure that presenters represent the communities they serve. And we know that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And while our speakers today are not from communities of color, they are all working in deep partnership with a variety of staff and stakeholders. We recognize that health equity requires us to do more. After our speakers share their wisdom with us, there will be time for Q&A at the end. However, I encourage you to use the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. If you have a question during the presentation, please do not use the chat for this purpose. We will try to get to as many questions as possible, but again, we have a very large audience today. If we see significant themes in the questions that we did not get to, we will ask our panelists to respond to them as best they can. Before we start, we're going to do a quick poll of the audience to give the speakers a sense of the audience's needs. So that poll should launch momentarily. And there are three questions in this poll. Please take a moment to answer. Does your campus mandate any of the following vaccinations for either some or all of the campus populations? Is your campus currently considering changes to their policies? And what do you consider to be the most significant barrier to achieving vaccine coverage on your campus? And I do notice in the chat, thank you, Deb, that the link uh, to the Avalara report is not working. We will update that momentarily. Thank you for letting us know. And we should have those, and we should have those poll results up in just a moment. Interesting. So the Hep B mandate is up there along with the meningitis, ACWY, and other vaccines, MMR. It's clearly in the lead at 82%. And when it comes to changing policies, few people are considering lessening requirements. 33% adding or tightening requirements. 35% said that they are not, their institutions are not considering changes right now and 31% do not know. And in terms of barriers, population vaccine hesitancy at 23%, um, and we will have lots of opportunities to talk about that as well, but also state and campus policies. Um, so I'm excited that this is um, a great entree um, to talk to our partners who are here to present to us today. And so with that, I'm delighted to welcome our speakers. Uh, next slide, please. Claire Hannon 
is the executive director of the Association of Immunization Managers, a nonprofit membership association representing the immunization programs and public health agencies in the states, territories, and several large cities. Claire has 23 years of experience in children's health and immunization, having worked on Capitol Hill, lobbied for children's health issues, and served as the director of ASTO, the direct, uh, excuse me, the director of immunization policy for the Association of T State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO, where she worked with state health officials, the CDC, and other partners to improve and enhance immunization policies and practices. Amy Pisani is the executive director of Vaccinate Your Family, formerly known as Every Child by Two. Amy has played an integral part in setting standards for immunization in America today. She has served as a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Vaccine Advisory Committee and regularly serves on CDC ad hoc committees. She's a proud Paul Harris Fellow and member of the Mystic Connecticut Rotary Club, where she serves as the chair of the Polio Plus Committee and Publicity Committee. Dr. Melanie Burnitz is the Senior Vice President for Columbia Health. She joined Columbia Health in 2016 and served as Associate Vice President and Medical Director through early 2021. Previously, she served as the Executive Director of the Student Health Service at Columbia University Medical Center and was a resident, Chief Resident and Faculty Member in Columbia Center for Family and Community Medicine. Dr. Burnitz is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Center for, of Family and Community Medicine and a member of Columbia University's COVID-19 Presidential Advisory Task Force. Um, and with that, I am delighted to hand it over to Claire Hannon. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And I can't tell, did my video go on? Okay, I don't know. It did. Yep, you were all set, Claire. Oh, okay, good. Because I um, was challenged by Amy to wear my college gear, so I did. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say um, thank you first to all of you um, working on college campuses to keep them open and keep them healthy and keep, um, you know, students able to learn, whether it's online or on campus. Um, I think it's just been an incredible job. I'm just really grateful. I have a college student. So um, I just thank you so much for everything you're doing. Um, and so I'm going to start and um, give just an overview of the COVID vaccination landscape and um, talk about, you know, where we are and where we're going, just kind of give the 30,000 foot view. Um, next slide. That's, so that's me. Yeah, next slide. So um, again, I'll, I'll give a little background about AIM, talk about the landscape, and then looking ahead, like where are we going? So next slide. So our association, as Claudia mentioned, is um, a nonprofit membership association. And we basically are representing the state health departments, their immunization program. So ordinarily, um, our members, the immunization managers would be running the Vaccines for Children program, would be um, doing a number of things, um, preventing outbreaks, um, enforcing school requirements, working with stakeholders, doing all those things on a routine basis. And we and, uh, provide a forum for them to share lessons learned, best practices, et cetera. Next slide. Um, the COVID-19 vaccination campaign. So I, this is really an unprecedented effort. And I know you've heard that before, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what that means because we don't ordinarily have public health providing vaccine for adults. Um, we have a vaccines for children program. It's a public program. And that's what we're basing this response on. But this is really the first time we've had a federally um, supplied purchased vaccine um, provided out through the public health system, which is state-based, using our healthcare system, which is private sector-based. So we've had to enroll tens of thousands of private providers. And we're using our Vaccines for Children program as a model for that um, and basically scaling it up. And this is how it works, right? We um, enroll private providers, hospitals, pharmacies, FQHCs, um, any, any number of providers into the program, they have to complete an agreement and you know agree to store the vaccine properly to give it to the right people. Uh, and, and then they have to also be able to 
report data on who they're vaccinating. So hopefully they would report into the state immunization information systems. But again, it's a state-based um, public health system with private providers getting them enrolled. And then you've got the federal government and data collection going into the federal level. So it really is an unprecedented marriage of these three uh, systems. And so it hasn't been without hiccups, but I think it's been incredible what we've been able to stand up in, in six or eight months. Um, and then you factor in that there are multiple brands um, of vaccines and vaccine candidates. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar with these. The Pfizer vaccine is a two dose, 21 days apart. Ultra cold storage um, that has been changed for a two week window can be stored in a freezer. And it comes in a minimum of 1170 doses, um, which is quite different than what we're used to with our providers in the Vaccines for Children program where they can order a minimum of 10 doses. Um, so this is complicated, right? The Moderna vaccine is two doses, 28 days apart. Um, it's frozen and it's a hundred dose minimum. The products are not interchangeable. And now we just have the Johnson and Johnson um, vaccine come out, which is one dose, refrigerator stable, a hundred dose minimum. So that just, it just adds to the complexity, um, you know, the, the, the storage and handling of these vaccines, the fact that they're different and the fact that they require different regimens. Um, we also have two other candidates that the government has backed, um, AstraZeneca and Novavax. They're both in phase three clinical trials. And so they may also be coming to the market um, perhaps as soon as April. We don't exactly know. Um, so again, the state-based data systems and distribution, and there is centralized ordering and centralized shipping. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of how it works. Um, the way that we are rolling out the vaccine is in phases, obviously, because of the limited supply. Um, next slide. So just to give you a sense of how big these phases are and how many people we're talking about vaccinating. Um, so we would be looking to vaccinate hopefully all Americans, which would be around 330 uh, million people. And then, you know, many of them having to get the two doses. So um, that's about 600 or more than 600 million doses. Uh, but in phase 1A, which was targeted to healthcare personnel and long-term care facilities, um, that was about 20 million people. Phase 1B, essential workers and adults greater than or, or equal to 75 years old. And then phase 1C, adults 65 to 74 or those with high risk medical conditions. Um, that in itself, those phases, just that phase one A, B and C, three, A, B and C, sorry, is um, almost 200 million or even more than 200 million people. So that just gives you a sense of how many people have to be vaccinated in this limited supply phase. Um, next slide. Um, so where are we now? So um, we're actually, as of March 5th, up to over 100 million doses um, shipped. And uh, we have delivered or given, administered 78.6 million doses. And 26 million people have received um, both doses, have completed the series. So soon after this week, we'll have those completing the series with one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So um, we've actually, this is more than we've ever given in this country in that short amount of time, two and a half months, there's more doses than we've ever given. So it is an incredible um, success in that regard. Most states, most states are in phase 1C, um, some are still in phase 1B, and some have switched to taking an age-based age based approach. So they're vaccinating down in increments of five. So like 65 and older going to 60 and older going to 55 and older. But you can see that we still have a ways to go um, before we get out of this prioritization and open it up more broadly. 
um, I wanted to mention that the federal government has also, in addition to this state-based approach, set up a retail pharmacy program where they're supplying some doses directly to large uh, retail pharmacy chains. Um, they've also set up FEMA-supported sites, so they're basically federally supported large-scale sites um, like Dodger Stadium and some other large-scale sites. And they're also supplying doses directly to some federally qualified health centers, about 250 across the country, um, trying to make sure that we're getting uh, communities that are harder to reach vaccine opportunities and access. Um, and just to mention another success is that we have seen a sharp decline in COVID cases and deaths in nursing homes, I think a 60% decline um, since, since getting uh, the nursing homes vaccinated. So this is a really good success. Next slide. Um, just, to, just to mention some of the challenges and I'm sure you're familiar with these. Um, so the way that they were that we're rolling this out with a state-based data systems, using national pharmacy chains, as well as enrolling private providers like hospitals, they may already have their own electronic health records, their own scheduling systems, um, and it's been very difficult marrying all those data systems. And it's been a struggle, a challenge to really set up a centralized states, setting up centralized pre-registration systems or scheduling systems. Um, we're continuing to improve those systems that are out there, but it is very hard to find vaccine. As I know firsthand, it's very hard. Um, it's still in limited supply. And um, you know these IT systems don't do everything we would like. Um, so we're also having some um, challenges getting complete race and ethnicity data. So about 55% of the data coming in is complete there. Um, and then, you know, we've had this pressure to get vaccine into arms, which has um, resulted in a lot of large scale clinics that are really, we're really getting efficient at doing that. Um, but it does leave us vulnerable for equity. And we want to make sure that we are getting um, equity, we're getting communities of color vaccinated, um, those communities that have been hit harder by the disease. We're not doing quite as well there. Um, and so you're seeing a focus on that with the federal government providing vaccine to FQHCs and states doing a number of different things there as well. Um, and then just the challenges with three different vaccines. Um, next slide. So looking, looking ahead, um, I said before we've shipped, we've delivered about a little over 100 million doses and we're into the beginning of March. Um, we should have 220 million doses out by the end of March. So that's a really, we're looking at a really big supply jump over the next several weeks. Um, we have Pfizer um, saying they would have 120 million doses out, another 180 million they've contracted for by the end of July. Um, Moderna, 100 million doses by the end of March, another 100 million by the end of June, another 100 million by the end of July. And now with Johnson & Johnson, um, 20 million they're saying by the end of March, another 100 million by the end of June. So um, President Biden is now saying that we could have enough vaccine for all adults by May 2021. Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of more optimistic than we originally thought. But for those of you, you know, the college campuses, that means that you could be getting vaccine earlier than you may have expected. Um, and this is all a good thing, right? So um, hopefully we're going to see this supply continue to really shoot up and we're going to see, see expansions over the next several weeks in the phases and get more people vaccinated so that we can get, again, open it to all healthy Americans. Um, next slide. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention too is that the Pfizer vaccine is authorized for ages 16 and up, the Moderna and Johnson and Johnson for ages 18 and up, and both Pfizer and Moderna are conducting um, clinical trials down to age 12. So the, the authorization could go down to age 12, perhaps sometime by summer. And um, under age 12, it would be later, but um, you probably don't have that many students under age 12. Um, okay, so I wanted to mention a few things more. The, the, there is a Ad Council education campaign that has a number of great materials and they're just putting out materials now. Um, it's called It's Up To You. They're launching this initiative. So we should start seeing this very soon. 
videos, ads, um, social media, to really get people socialized to the idea of getting vaccinated, to getting them comfortable with it, so that as supply continues to ramp up and it becomes available, um, people are excited to get the vaccine, younger people, especially that younger cohort that hasn't been prioritized yet. Um, next slide. And then I wanted to emphasize the safety of the vaccine. I know this is a question that comes up and there are several um, key systems that monitor the safety of vaccine as we roll it out. Of course, robust clinical trials were conducted, even though we shortened um, the general research and development phase. Um, we did that by putting steps in parallel uh, and we did not compromise the, the safety. So the robust trials were conducted and now as the vaccines authorized and being given out, the CDC has multiple systems um, checking on the safety of the vaccine and anytime they see that um, there could be, um, for example, the allergic reactions, there are more allergic react reactions happening in those who got vaccinated than in the background population. They are able to investigate, they are able to catch that, they are able to make recommendations. Um, you can see more information about this on cdc.gov slash vaccine safety. I'm not going to go into every slice of it because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, but that just gives you a broad overview. Um, I'm happy to talk um, in more depth with you if you are looking to be a vaccine provider. How do I do that? How would I, you know, um, um, uh, collaborate with a vaccine provider to give vaccines on campus or any information around that, how to, how to enroll with the state, I'm happy to do that offline. But I will stop there and um, happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, that was fantastic. And um, I know a few questions have come in to the chat, I'm sorry, to the Q&A uh, while you were talking that I think um, would be really interesting to address. But without wasting any time, um, I am happy to hand it over to Amy Pisani. Terrific, thank you so much. You couldn't see Claire's shirt, but she's a Wagner mom and I'm a Yukon mom. So um, we're hoping our kids will eventually get together because they're the same age, right, Claire? Not on camera now, but I know she's nodding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you. I'm really grateful. Um, Claire's group is really, um, the Association of Immunization Managers are really the group out there that are making sure that all those vaccines that come into our system are in, um, able to be distributed. And as you can imagine, it is a huge task right now in our nation. Um, I'm today going to actually talk about something that is not COVID related, um, but what we'd like to do is, um, I guess I'm the lucky one because I feel like that's all we talk about now, but all of my partners and I and Claire and all of the groups we partner with, we, um, we worry just as much about the routine vaccines that are not happening right now because of COVID. So that is what I will be focusing on. Um, next slide. It just went to the other one. tight folks. Thanks for your patience. So I'll just tell you a little bit about vaccinate your family so you can have an understanding of um, the different piece, the different um, pieces that we work on. So what we do is our mission. We're, we've been around for about 30 years now and we raise awareness of the need for immunizations. We work very hard to increase the public's understanding of the benefits of vaccines. We are on many collaboratives on increasing confidence in the safety of vaccines. Um, we are also on the Ad Council um, collaborative. Uh, we've been you know, doing a lot of work on COVID, but we do this in our space, um, just generally speaking for the last, it's probably been about a 15 year endeavor when folks started to um, have more questions about vaccines. And right now what we're trying to do with COVID is really to help create readiness because everyone should ask questions, right? Everyone should ask questions about any kind of medical product you're using for yourself or your children or your, Loved ones. So now we're, walk, we're talking about COVID readiness, and that's really a big piece. Um, we also work quite a bit on ensuring that families have access to life-saving vaccines. Um, one thing that we're really excited about, um, we just uh, announced an initiative with the National Council of Negro Women, and what we're going to be doing is in 10 states, we'll be working to um, basically create um, a group of women that, that they, they represent about 2 million women of African descent in America. And we'll be um, educating them on COVID and helping them become COVID um, basically COVID heroes and helping to get themselves and their communities all the information they need in order to be ready. And then we do quite a bit of work on the policies that support timely vaccinations. And 
you know, especially the work that we needed to get the funds in to ensure that we had um, the ability to even give the COVID vaccines out. And um, again, we work quite a bit with the Association of Immunization Managers and others on that. Next slide. Um, this is a lot of discussion about the equitable distribution. Um, there's a lot going on out there that, I mean, more and more now we're seeing people understand the disparity issue. It is nothing new. Um, it has been a really bad problem for a long time. We're very fortunate that the Vaccines for Children program has really helped to eliminate a lot, of, a lot of the disparities among children, but there are still issues with economic barriers for children. Um, so we're not, you know, we haven't completely crossed the goal line, but among um, older children and adults, we have a serious disparity. So um, we're, the only silver lining in my opinion of COVID is that people are now starting to recognize that this is a serious problem. And, you know, even just groups like um, ACHA, I mean, having the ability to work with you all and to speak with you and see if we can come up with policies that can be changed for the permanent would be the, it's just really ideal. The next slide. So what is it that we do? Well, you know, why do we do what we do? And um, at Vaccinate Your Family, we have the opportunity, we've met so many families who have lost loved ones or have suffered from vaccine preventable diseases. Um, they come to us and they want to tell their story so they can help other families not suffer the agony um, that they have suffered. And I wanted to just share one story with you. It's Patty's story. Um, and I noticed that in the survey, it said that um, only 16% of colleges mandate MenB vaccine and 37% um, mandate the meningococcal ACWI. This story talks about why it's important to really focus on um, ensuring, even if it's not a mandate, just a recommendation, a letter that goes home to college students to say why you should get all of your vaccines. So can you play the video, please? My daughter, Kim, was one of the funniest people I ever met. She was a beautiful girl inside and out. In June of 2012, Kim was in her last week of high school. She was graduating. She was 17 years old. She was looking forward to prom and graduation. And she came home from school one afternoon with body aches and a fever of 101. When we woke up the next morning, she said, Ma, everything hurts me from my eyelashes down to my toes, and I feel like my ankle is bleeding. So I pulled back the sheets, and I saw three tiny purple dots on one of her ankles. And being a registered nurse, I knew this was very serious, um, and I rushed her to the emergency room. The doctor in the emergency room told me that she suspected Kimberly had bacterial meningitis. And I told the doctor that can't be possible because I made sure Kim was vaccinated with the meningitis vaccine. What I didn't know was that the meningitis vaccine that she received did not protect her against meningitis B. So I thought that I had done everything that I could for my daughter. And actually I did at the time because at that time we did not have a meningitis B vaccine in the United States. So when Kimberly got to the ICU, to the pediatric ICU, her organs were failing. And as the days went on, um, it was determined that Kim did not have blood flow to her brain and she was declared brain dead. So at that point, I had to make the most difficult decision of my life to remove my perfectly healthy 17-year-old daughter from life support. Every parent, every child needs to know that they are not fully protected against meningococcal disease unless they receive two different meningitis vaccines. One is called the MenACWY vaccine, which is the meningitis vaccine, the common vaccine. The other is the MenB vaccine. Infants and young adults, adolescents, between the ages of 16 to 23 years old are at highest risk. I love Vaccinate Your Family. Through the Kimberly Coffee Foundation, they are going to help us spread our message even further. As parents, what we do is protect our children. And what better way to do that is through vaccination. We actually have the power to prevent a disease.
Thank you for showing that. Um, so Patty is um, again with the Kimberly Coffee Foundation and we, um, oh, you have to pause the other video. We do partner with a lot of different groups. Um, I think that's really the beauty of working in public health. We, um, we all work together to help uh, you know, eliminate these diseases that are, are, that are taking the lives of people. Um, what the problem is that a lot of families just don't have any idea about the different diseases that they should be vaccinating against. They don't know about the difference between MEN-B, men -A -C -W -Y. Um, And then we're looking at, you know, we have Tamika Felder, who she's from Survivor. Um, she's a cervical cancer survivor um, and she contracted HPV. We know right now that we are about a million doses behind or more on getting um, our 11 and 12 year olds vaccinated against HPV because of the pandemic. So we have a lot of work to do in the public health space and in the, and in the private provider space because we have to figure out how are we gonna get all of these kids back in potentially before they're recommended for COVID vaccine because you can't co-administer um, and they have to have a pause. So um, we need your help. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really big task. And when you're, you know, when you're doing your work this year, um, you know, to get people up to date um, and make sure that you're, you know, you're checking in your schools, you know, it's also flu as well. You know, Angelina lost her, her adult sister to flu. Um, so we have the stories and um, you have a captive audience. Next slide. When you're, um, you know, when you're vaccinating against COVID potentially, or when you're doing your flu clinics, um, you know, during that period when you're keeping people, if you're, you know, especially for COVID, that 15 minute window where you um, are, you know, watching um, the students who, or, or excuse me, or the faculty, of course, um, or anyone on the university um, level, you have an opportunity maybe to get some information to them. Maybe you could show videos or you can hand them information and really start the conversation about vaccines. Um, help them become confident in them and, and really try to start nurturing these new partnerships because it's these people that will be able to help spread the word about the power of vaccines and have the pride, you know, that they either got a COVID vaccine or a flu vaccine come flu season. Um, I know my son, he's a biology student at UConn and he's really trying hard to see Bill mandate flu vaccine on his campus, um, him and his biology um, fraternity. And I would encourage, you know, work with those fraternities that are interested in science and see what kind of policies you might implement and make a real change. Um, next slide. So just a couple of resources um, we want to make sure you have available. You know, why do you want to pull in your influencers? You know how important it is right now. Obviously, um, it seems like everyone is trying to find the most popular person when it comes to COVID, um, you know, to try to help share. I got my vaccine, but, um, you know, it's very different and every school is different. Obviously, you know your community better than anyone. So I would just say really try to identify those influencers and, you know, create a social campaign that can help spread the good word about vaccines. Next slide. And there's a couple of resources that can help you. Um, at our website on vaccinateyourfamily.org, we have a very extensive website um, with COVID vaccine facts on there. Um, we answer all the tough questions that people have, and we have a lot of different social media um, graphics that you can use for free. You can just co-brand them. Um, we have graphics on every issue you can imagine. So it doesn't have to just be about COVID. We can tell you, you know, talk to you about HPV. We can talk to you about um, you know, why you want to make sure that um, you and your siblings are vaccinated against all the other vaccine preventable diseases. Next slide. Um, and so when you come to our, our site, this is our section on, on COVID um, questions. Claire talked about the vaccine safety. Um, we do have an extensive section in there that talks about the different oversight systems, because I think people are concerned. They want to know, fine, they got, they got authorized by FDA, but what does that mean now for the future of the safety? Are they still following it? And you know, it's important for us to continually tell people because we think everyone's heard it, but believe me, every time we go on another call, we find out there's a whole nother audience of people who don't, who haven't heard it at nauseum like we have. Next slide. So, um, so just, I would recommend, I would ask you to follow us on, on social media, not so much so that we can get our word out, but so that we can get our word to you. And so we can make your jobs easier. Um, we share our graphics um, with partners all over the nation. And again, we're always happy to co-brand. So, you know, happy for you to reach out and we'd be, you know, working with, with the college health groups um, and, and we can maybe make a partnership. Next slide. And these are just a couple of examples of some of the social media um, graphics that we have. And then we have a lot of different videos as well. We're doing a series of, um, of Ask the Experts on COVID. Um, it will be from um, folks from different, um, different um, races will be um, featured in our videos and also people who are speaking different languages. We're translating our materials all into Spanish, our entire website and six other 
commonly spoken languages in the US um, for a majority of materials. And that should be done in the next two months or so. Next slide. And I think that's everything for me. I'm so grateful to be here. And again, always happy to answer questions. You can reach me at amy at vaccinateyourfamily.org. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Amy. And I'll just note that um, someone was curious about uh, materials to address anti-vaccination groups. And I know that um, your website has a ton of fantastic materials about this. Um, so we will be posting lots of um, links in the chat. Um, but with that, thank you so much, Amy. I'm delighted to hand it over to Dr. Melanie Burnett. Thank you, Claudia, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, just, just before I start, I am um, representing Columbia University um, in terms of what we do. Um, our Columbia Health oversees six key service units that are displayed here. We provide care for about 28,000 eligible students across 12 schools on the Morningside and Manhattanville campuses, and that includes both undergraduates and graduate programs. Next slide. <laughs> Sim uh, only these are the objectives today. Similar to what Amy said, it's actually a challenge to talk about something other than COVID-19. Um, but I was asked to speak to our experience around a meningitis B outbreak that we had on campus back in 2019. And, and thinking back and preparing for this reminded me how any infectious disease challenge on a campus allows us to use those same infection control and prevention principles, whether it be two cases in a single location or a global pandemic. So I am going to, you know, kind of change course and speak about our experience with meningitis B in 2019 and really use it to help think through how it's informing some of our own university response and planning. Next slide. Um, so thinking about meningitis B, um, while cases occur, outbreaks of meningitis are actually rare in the United States, then only about one in 20 cases of meningitis are related to outbreaks. But of course, with any outbreak, they're unpredictable and the outcomes can be very devastating um, to affected communities and organizations. And when, when we pulled data looking from January 1st, 2008 through June 30th, 2017, um, there were 11 clusters or outbreaks of serogroup B meningococcal disease among university students in close contact. And these clusters ranged in duration from a few days to nearly three years. Um, and the, the cluster or outbreak size ranging from 12 to 13 cases. And you can see across a variety of schools with undergraduate population sizes ranging from anywhere from 4,000 students to 35,000 students. Um, Memvi vaccines, which James spoke about um, through the video, have been used in response to all eight zero group B university outbreaks that happened since 2013, um, when these vaccines first became available for outbreak response. And that was actually prior to them being licensed in the United States, which happened in March 2017. So next slide, please. So I, I just want to talk through the cases that, that um, caused our outbreak. And the first case presented to our medical services on January 26th of 2019, that's actually a Saturday when we just run a small urgent care clinic. And this case was a 27 year old male um, who described sudden onset fever, body aches and headache. He had returned from travel to China um, just a couple of weeks early and he was very ill appearing with a low grade fever. And in the clinic, we gave him some intravenous fluids. He, was, he, he perked up, he was a lot better. So we discharged him home with a friend and told him he should go to the emergency room if his symptoms worsened. Two days later, he did have worsening symptoms and reported to the emergency room with a rash and was admitted to the ICU and diagnosed with meningococcal bacteremia. There he received IV antibiotics. Um, he did have one complication with a septic arthritis of his left shoulder, but he was dis discharged after a week um, and received four weeks of antibiotics intravenously and, and had an unremarkable recovery. Next slide. Um, in response to this, um, immediately, obviously, we were following the patient in the hospital and we did immediate tracing of his close contacts so we could hemoprophylax those. We also had to provide reassurance to our staff who had seen the patient regarding their own exposure. And in the longer term, our social workers worked, worked with the hospital team around his discharge planning, considering he was also getting IV antibiotics. And based on this complication, um, you know, the, this infection needed some academic and housing accommodations and referrals for specialists around his shoulder. In the next slide. So while we were managing that, um, on January 31st, a call came into our after hours phone service um, regarding a 35 year old man who was complaining of the worst headache of his life. Um, on questioning him through the, the phone consult, he had a high fever and described diplopia, vertigo, reduced hearing, nausea and vomiting and was immediately referred to the ER. 
in the emergency room. He had a CAT scan, which was negative, a flu test, which was negative, um, and initially a, a failed spinal tap, and he, but he did have an elevated white count. And he was um, diagnosed um, based on this with um, meningitis and given IV antibiotics. Interestingly, his wife at the time was also 28 weeks pregnant, so that obviously raised some concern. He had a two week um, course in the hospital um, with some hearing loss in his left ear and ongoing vertigo, and what did have to take a leave of absence from school for the semester because of the, the complications and the impact it had on his academics. Um, as the investigation was going on, he was not known to have any contact with case one, though they were part of the same school and this was a graduate school. Next slide. So um, what happened? Well, we immediately connected after case one with our, our local New York City Department of Health um, when the diagnosis was confirmed. And once case two was confirmed, we involved both the State Department of Health and the CDC. And just based on these two cases, an outbreak was declared because these were within the same organization, not only the same university, but within the same school within a three month period. We then worked very closely with our partner agencies for response and communications, as well as actually getting shared resources from campuses that had, some, had similar outbreaks outbreaks. Next slide. This will start to look familiar to all of you. This then triggered activation of our university's instance response team. At the time, that was comprised of a range of stakeholders across campus. And as I say, very familiar to all of us now in the post-COVID campus. But at the time, it was very unusual for this group to meet regularly. But it was in place to bring together a range of experts to guide next steps. And you can see the kind of representation we had, um, ranging from health to public safety to communications and university leadership. Next slide. Rapidly, we launched a, a multi-pronged communication strategy, and that went from the individual level um, with such contact notification through organizational and community levels. Um, it included letters, web updates, FAQs, media coverage. Um, we, we didn't hear from that many community members. We had about 21 responses to the initial um, um, outreach, 11 were having some element of concern, which was addressed, and we just reinforced with follow-up. Um, of people who were concerned about exposures, one, um, only one went, was referred to the hospital and one was seen in the clinic. Next slide. Um, this is kind of slightly different to our COVID response because this was a limited outbreak in terms of the numbers affected and all within one school, we made a decision not to restrict campus access or travel. Um, we early on canceled one party, but no other activity restrictions were put in place, but we did use widespread education with building cleaning and maintenance schedules reviewed. We offered chemo prophylaxis of close contacts um, immediately, um, as soon as possible after it was determined that the outbreak had, exist, exist, uh, had existed and we managed to do this within a couple of days. Um, and then we um, did see significant demand from non-indicated community members for a single dose um, ciprofloxacin chemoprophylaxis, um, but we told them it wasn't necessary. Next slide. So the immunization strategy, um, in, as I mentioned, back in 2014 and 2015, two serogroup B meningococcal vaccine, MEM B vaccines were licensed in the U US. Um, that's Bexera and Trumember are the brand names. And they are recommended for groups at increased risk for meningococcal disease. That includes persons at risk during an out outbreak. So that these questions start to look really familiar as we think about vaccine eligibility during COVID-19. But in 2019, these were our considerations. We had to ask who should get vaccinated? Should it be students? Should it be faculty and staff? What are the vaccine indications by age? When should we give that vaccine? Who's paying for this? And this realization, well, while there wasn't clear science for vaccination after the event, particularly in, in this kind of outbreak, it certainly wasn't going to hurt. We had to look very clearly at the financials. This was not cheap, particularly if the university was funding it. Um, and we also had to think about how many students would actually take us up on this offer. Remember, this was in a graduate population, which was very unusual. Um, we, we used a lot of our flu modeling to think about our modeling, and we ordered 2,000 doses of vaccines as our starting point. Next slide. We set up vaccine clinics and initially two clinics for dose one and a second clinic for dose two um, at a later date. And we had four hours each. We set up screening tables where we were looking for confirmation of eligibility, um, explaining the vaccine, answering questions, providing education, reviewing contraindications, then registering our patients in our electronic medical record. We had six vaccine stations set up. We had a rest area. So it wasn't, you didn't need an observation area as we do with COVID-19, but so people could rest if they 
they felt like they needed to after the vaccine. We had on-site security because people were coming in asking for the vaccine when they were not falling into the eligible categories. And we had to think through staffing. We utilized some of our clinical staff, our RNs for vaccine administration, but we used um, a lot of our non-clinical staff, including our health promotion um, educators to help with the screening and the education pieces. And what we found, we had um, uh, dose two, the most significant complaint was a very, very sore arm from our students. Next slide. Um, you can see that of um, at dose one, we gave a total of 610 doses, 535 at the fair, the rest were in our clinic. The eligible population was 1700, so we only got 36% vaccinated. And then there was a steep drop off at dose two. Um, what we heard was many people didn't want to get dose two because they really didn't like the side effects of dose one or didn't think that they were at risk. And we were down to 23% of that school who were fully vaccinated. Next slide. So as we reflected, um, it was important to review all elements of the response. Thankfully, we had no further cases. It does remain unclear if these efforts with the chemoprophylaxis, the education, the communication, and the vaccination efforts broke the transmission cycle, or if these two cases would have remained isolated regardless. But the key challenges, which we've all seen during our COVID responses on campus, are the same. It's around cross-campus collaborations, the partnerships, considering the cost of any response, student involvement, or in the case of this vaccination effort, what we, we really thought of as some vaccination apathy. Um, so really thinking through the use of resources and the extent of the outreach. And next slide. So as we think about the implications for COVID-19 and having gone through the MEMB experience, you know, at the time back in 2019, we thought it was a really big deal. Um, and it certainly helped us lay the groundwork for our COVID-19 response, which of course is just far greater than anything we did back then in 2019. And when I wrote the list of implications for COVID-19, the list is exactly the same. So the first part was thinking about your cross-campus resources. Um, with COVID-19, the success on any campus has relied on those partnerships and those collaborations. And having that groundwork was really helpful for us. And critical has been the support of university leadership. Without letting all those layers of bureaucracy many of us have within our institutions stifle the expertise of those who are in public health roles. And partnering between the decision makers and the operational experts is really essential. And that's going to be true as we roll out our vaccine efforts on campus. I think understanding the multiple layers of the university, whether it be residential or facilities, is really necessary to put those plans in place. Communications has been the cornerstone of any good public health response, and I think we saw some of that as well with, with the prior presentation. As we say, communicate, communicate, and then communicate some more, because any gaps in the communication really incite fear and concern about lack of transparency. So utilizing many modes and ongoing reinforcement is key, and for us, we're hosting now bi-weekly webinars for our populations, we're updating the website daily, we're sharing data, so there's transparency around there. We're sending email health advisories, and we're also using social media and video um, to inform all of our response. Obviously, identification of cases is an important element of COVID-19, and like many others, we've set up a testing program to support this. The contact tracing, which for the MENDI outbreak was done on a very small level, using just class lists and social interactions has taken on a whole new meaning in the COVID-19 world. Um, for us here at Columbia, we have a team of four contact tracing supervisors and 20 contact tracers who are following up on any positive tests. And then obviously coordination with local health authorities is essential. Um, it, it, we relied on them very heavily during the MENDI response and during COVID-19, it's kind of reversed. They've relied on us to manage our on campus population because it really takes the strain off some of the community mitigation work that they're doing. Um, but we have to communicate and make sure we're coordinated and having the right connections in those local health authorities is really important. So our vaccination plans are the emerging area. Um, here in New York, we are awaiting allocation of vaccine to university, but we've been able to at least put those models in place for the rollout. So when that good news that we have vaccine available comes, we're gonna have a mass vaccination site ready. Having done that on the small scale for MenB and larger scale for our flu fares really provides us with a good framework that we can adapt for COVID-19. And it's important to look at the differences, right? The numbers needed, the second dose, the answering questions, which are gonna be more than we do during our flu fares, the different storage criteria, maybe different needs around pharmacy and diluting and things like that. Um, so looking at all of those, so we're ready to go. And then finally, the considerations on how to continue to support the community, both on the physical and the mental health side. 
for it, us, this has actually changed how we even define who's part of our community and how we deliver our services. So I think we're going to be remembering the lessons learned around telehealth. The innovative ways we've all had to come up with to support our community are going to be really helpful as we look to the fall and hopefully returning and resuming post-pandemic campus life. And with that, I will pause and turn it back. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was uh, fantastic. And I now have about 100% more questions to ask after your presentation. <laughs> um, and thank you all. I think uh, the, the conversation could go on for hours, but I want to make sure that I address a question that came up uh, multiple times in our Q&A, and I know has been a frequent conversation for everybody involved in this effort. And that is, where do we see the, um, the leadership around vaccination mandates going? Do you expect to see mandates coming from the federal level or the state level or the institutional level? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, and with that, I think we can open it up to all three panelists. Um, well, this is Claire. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start talking about that. The, the mandate issue, normally with, um, with colleges, we would see the mandate um, coming from a state or from the institution. So the states would um, do laws around school requirements um, or they can add a vaccine to their existing school requirement um, issue. And, and then generally with adult vaccines, we would see institutional uh, mandates. So hospitals, sometimes mandate flu, um, we wouldn't really see that at the state level, although there are some state laws around flu. Um, that having been said, the, with the COVID, um, we've already seen that some employers, for example, some nursing homes have mandated the vaccine for their employees. Um, but it is authorized under emergency use, which is not meant to be mandated. So these employers can do that because they, in, 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 aspects are are offering a choice because if you don't want to get the vaccine then you don't have to work for them i'm not sure that that would work um, for colleges so i think that the vaccine in order to look ahead and to look at potentially having a school requirement would need to be licensed and um you know that may come later in the summer we really don't know may come in the fall really don't know the timing on that and then normally we don't, we, in, in public health, we look at school requirements as a very effective tool, um, but we, we like to see certain criteria met before there would be a requirement. Um, and, you know, we would want to make sure that, like, for example, some of those criteria around um, uptake being at a level um, that's already pretty high um, and having coverage for the vaccine so it's affordable, it's accessible. Um, all of that being said, it's really hard to know what's gonna happen in the next you know, six months, um, what the environment's gonna be like and whether that environment would support uh, a, a college or university mandate for COVID vaccine. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to know, but certainly as an emergency use authorization, I don't, I don't necessarily see that happen. There are 50, bill, 50 or more bills, I think I saw today in a, hand, a handful or more states that are in session right now dealing with this issue, dealing with COVID vaccine mandates. Um, none of them would require it for a college campus, but um, this is definitely going to be a hot issue, a debated issue. And it's just, um, as far as the emergency use authorization and whether it can be mandated, it's, it's, it's really gonna be up to courts, I think, to finally decide that. But we do see some employers already trying it. And I will just add, I agree and concur with everything Claire said. This year on our campus, for the first time, we mandated the flu vaccine. Um, so putting, um, pieces in place, and that is above the New York State requirement, which is only the MMR and the meningococcal requirement in New York. But so we have at least put in place a policy, a procedure, a process 
um, around a vaccine mandate. So if we do get to that stage, either with a state mandate or an institutional decision, once full FDA approval is acquired, that you know how you will approach it, you know, obviously with all the abilities for exemptions around medical and religious exemptions as are required under your state. Thank you so much. Um, to hearken back to what uh, what you were just talking about with the your experience with meningitis B, um, Melanie, can you tell us your thoughts about whether college health providers need to be thinking about how to make sure that we get students back um, or community members back for their second vaccine and, and what you learned in the challenge of getting folks back for their second men B vaccine that we yeah, should be I thinking about going forward? Absolutely, I think it's really important, and particularly now with the Janssen J and J vaccine coming to the market, is thinking through if you are, have concerns about second dose um, non-adherence, then thinking through particularly a one-dose vaccine. So I think it's going to be balancing. So I saw one of the questions was around what happens if our students are about to leave campus. Well, we should only if we have a two-dose series, we should only be giving it to students who have that two-dose. Um, availability. I think this is different in that for the Pfizer and Moderna, um, what we're hearing most reports is that the side effects aren't as severe after dose one. Um, so you don't lose folks who just didn't really like the side effects. And that's really what happened with the MENB. And then the education, the reminders, you know, the, the appointment card, scheduling that second appointment when someone leaves their first. So it's not, nothing is left to chance in ensuring that we get completion of a course if it is a two dose series. Thank you yeah. so much. Another Please. strategy too is to um, schedule the second dose at the same time you're scheduling the first dose or this when they show up for the first dose, schedule that second dose and really, you know, lock it in sort of on their calendar. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's, that's what we're doing with, you know, the vaccination now with the COVID, even with, you know, an adult, so schedule that second dose, make it, make it a regimen. Excellent. Um, another trend I'm seeing in the questions is how do we get ahead of that anticipated pushback that campuses might get when we move towards a, a mandate? Um, I think that many of us are trying to think about how to be proactive in that work. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about how to anticipate um, any potential pushback to those mandates. I, I always, we're framing it now very much under the harm reduction approach that we use in college health so often. So we're not starting with a mandate, right? We, we, we're amping up, we're doing that communication, we're doing that education, we're really thinking through the broader public health. Um, you know, you're looking at so many of the campaigns that the other speakers have talked about, you know, why are you getting vaccinated? I'm not only doing this for me, I'm doing it for my family, I'm doing it for my community and all these other reasons. So the hope is you don't have to get to a mandate if we can get to a place where there's just widespread acceptance of vaccinations. But I think kind of laying the foundation and laying the groundwork and the same was true with the flu mandate. It wasn't just an overnight announcement. There's a lot of preparation that goes in, a lot of explanation as to the why and an understanding that, you know, this, this isn't a punishment mandate. This is a safety mandate. This allows us to have everybody on campus and doing our in-person activities. Um, so I think so much of it is around the messaging and then I say the, the just kind of the escalating to it and not just um, landing that right away. So even though we don't have mandates at this point, right, um, we should be starting that ground. Many of us have started that groundwork already. Yeah, yeah great. Um, well, I noticed that we are at time. Um, I'm not surprised that it went so fast, um, but I would like to say thank you to our wonderful speakers today. Um, thank you so, so much. Uh, we know how busy all of you are um, and appreciate the time that you took to share your expertise with us. To our audience, please stay tuned for information on how you can support vaccine confidence from the Campus COVID-19 Vaccine Initiative, uh, an ACHA project funded in part by a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Links to further reading will be posted in the chat and will also be included in the emails that will follow up from today's conversation. Thank you all for coming today and we wish you well.